Hi, Barney. Thank you very much for joining the Secrets of Talent. Really appreciate your time. I'd like to start no with you and your first, uh, so your first ever job and that sort of journey to becoming a HR director for News UK. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm one of these people that fell into HR. There aren't many people my age anyway who purposefully tried to get into HR. I didn't even know what HR was um, to begin with when I came out from university. Uh, but what I discovered was I enjoyed speaking to people. I enjoyed the recruiting aspect. Um, and I was just like a bit of a sponge, really, and soaking it all up and, you know, coming out of uni and realising that there was this whole kind of human capital aspect the business um so that's how I got into it so I worked at Waterstone initially worked my way up there an HMB group then came over to the UK as an HR business partner um and I've been working here nearly 12 years now um and progressed from HR business partner to head of HR and more recently to HR director and in the last few years I've also led on the diversity and inclusion aspect of our business team. so you must have seen Considering News UK is largely a, a sort of media publishing and w with a mixture of technology, you must have seen sort of talent change over time uh, th throughout the, throughout your period. Yeah, incredibly so. I mean, when I joined um, in 2011, the I remember celebrating the um, Times iPad app edition, um, the first birthday of that. Um, so it wasn't like digital was brand new, but it that you know that was quite an experiment for the company, um, and it's one that's been incredibly successful. But you know other parts of the business were um, trying to understand what digital meant for them, and I was working mainly with the advertising function, and you know it, it things changed very quickly in advertising because it went from the phone ringing to suddenly you know with um, with the print edition kind of dropping in readership and digital going up everyone had to figure out a whole new way of doing business and um i was part of working with the advertising teams to figure that out and to create uh, a new way really so yeah in 12 years things have changed beyond recognition um and all the departments have changed with the needs of the business and we've gone from running newspapers to running a multimedia business with radio and TV and audio, and it all works together really well. Yeah, and and especially during the pandemic, where you know the the, the need for uh, digital related products was massive. It, it massively changes uh, the the way in which people think about the people they need rather than the people they used to think they need. But kind of going back to sort of your first sort of HR experience. Uh, and clearly hiring must have been part of that process. Do you remember sort of your first hire and what was that like when you were, when you were in that position? Um, I mean, my first experience of hiring was recruiting 50% of the Wolfgang's back in the North Seas now. Um, and I just found it fascinating, um, you know, talking to people about why they were interested in getting into fixing them. Um, and, understanding individuals what their aspirations were where they were in their life um it, it was just a whole new thing for me and then as I progressed within Waterstone to getting to the point where I was interviewing assistant managers and branch managers and you know I think the thing that really struck me at that point was what I brought to the interview process was really understanding the leadership side and the people side and connecting with them as leaders and understanding you know what their views were and how to manage people and how to get the best out of people um rather than just thinking about the practicalities of managing the shop that's interesting i think the thing with hiring is that it, it it's you know as as you as a business grows it becomes probably the most important part of the business and uh and, and certainly in my case when you know i've been being a small startup every single day you're thinking okay well how can i uh, uh what sort of people do i need to be able to do this this function that function and you do learn something new every single time uh, okay. which, which is a a fascinating aspect of it 
Diversity, equity, inclusion. You mentioned that uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is something that's part of sort of your remit and your uh, uh, your sort of lead within uh, News UK. So, what does diversity, equity, inclusion uh, look and mean like to News UK? And I know I, I hear you've got a bit of a strategy behind it. Yeah. So, I think if I start off with why I became interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion is because I have had um, two children whilst I've been working at news. And um, when I came back from having my second, I looked around and saw, actually, there aren't many of us, as in you know, mums that um, go on maternity, come back to work, work full time, and, you know, continue to progress. Um, and I just thought, you know, I've made it work and it worked really well for me. I had a really positive experience. And so I was keen to help others replicate that. And I started with um, coaching, because I'm a, a coach at work as part of our internal coaching scheme. And um, I started coaching returning mums and supporting their return to work and helping them think about you know, what it was going to look like and overcoming some of the challenges. So that was my first foray. And then there was an opportunity to um, take more of a lead of it within HR which I snapped up and then as soon as you start working in DNI, if you've got an interest in it you know you start to realize how huge it is and how many things as a white woman in the workplace I just hadn't thought about and it just made me really think about my experience at university and my previous jobs you know um, I live in Colchester and Essex but I lived in London for a few years and thinking about the difference between those locations um, and it just kind of gave me, you know, something new to think about and something that I was really passionate about. But what it means for news is if, you know, you have to be able to appeal to a wide range of people. Um, and, you know, we know that this is everywhere, but, you know, a few years ago, the, um, the j journalists, I think the figure is 92% of journalists were white and then you have to think about the content that those journalists are going to create and what who they're going to appeal to and what their experience is um so that really resonated as, as something that needed to be reviewed and looked at and how we could open up um to attract more people of color um, but also looking at gender looking at disability sexual orientation all aspects of diversity um, so it's it's creating content that appeals to all. Do you find it difficult to kind of balance the, um, or was it easier or difficult to kind of balance what you need to kind of focus on when it comes to diverse? Because there's so many different um, avenues to take when it comes to uh, diverse. I mean, you mentioned uh, the the you, you landed on diversity and inclusion as a mother, but and and a second time mother. But do you find it that it was a, a process you had to go through to kind of understand what was needed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the way we tackled it, because everyone has their own interests and their own concerns, but we realised that we didn't have much data. So we, we only had data really around gender and passport nationality because those were the legal requirements that we had to track. So we started um, a diversity demographic survey for all employees. And once we got the responses from that, we were able to go, okay, these need to be our focus areas. And the focus areas that we chose were gender. Um, we were 36% female, which is above the media average at that time, of 29%, but still, you know, we said, well, actually yeah. we'd like to be 50-50. Um, and um, ethnic minorities, I think we were 8% at that point. Um, and so we identified those two as our focuses because we said, we want to do this well, so we're going to choose two. Uh, that's not to say we don't care about the rest, but let's focus on those for a couple of years and let's see what we've done. That's very interesting. Kind of coming to probably my next question, which is around, well, you've got a strategy in place. So what are the sort of fundamental pillars to a success of a strategy to... Um, ensure that from a diverse inclusion and diverse equity inclusion perspective? Yeah, so we formulated a strategy in 2020 um, and our strategy has three pillars which are still in place today. Um, our pillars are early talent, 
so if you think back to what I said about um, the legacy of the journalism industry, um, if we can bring in diversity into our intern and apprenticeship roles, that helps create uh, a future talent pipeline. Uh, so that's a big focus for us. Uh, the, then we have the leadership pillar, and that's all about anything to do with employees, really. So all of our networks, and we have 11 of those now, our, our employee resource groups. Um, all of our policies, the training that we provide, um, coaching, sponsorship, all of that fits within that pillar. And then our third pillar is quite unique to us in the media industry, I think, and that's our content. We call that the creative diversity pillar. So that's thinking about, you know, Black History Month, what are the sun doing? Black History Month, for example, what's talk sport doing? And really working with our um, editorial and content areas um, to support them and you know things like when we had the World Cup we ran some training on um, Qatar and what to expect in Qatar and um, that was really well received but we also have language guides that we provide all about the four things as well thinking about different and um, diverse characteristics and how best to talk about those or work about those and networks is central to everything that we do but I think it's it's also really important to establish what the networks are responsible for and what the company is responsible for because you can't just outsource Black History Month to we have a cultural diversity network. That's you know it's not all on the network. It needs to be a partnership between the company and the networks. But at the same time, like they come up with ideas as well. So we have Virgin Radio Pride, which was a collaboration between the Virgin Radio team and our News Is Out network which worked incredibly well and has won awards. Um, and we're also launching a sponsorship program, which was an initiative created by the chairs of the Cultural Diversity Network. So there's lots of ideas and things that come through due to the networks, which is fantastic. Well, what is the sponsorship element? So, Because I, I hear a lot about sponsorship, but what, what, what does the sponsorship ele element aspect mean? Yeah, so this program is for um, women or ethnic minorities or both. Um, and it's our executive team partnering and sponsoring one individual um, and helping them with their career, um, thinking about what they want to do next and supporting them and get, getting there, get, using their experience, but also their positions of influence uh, to support more junior uh, people within the workplace. But then we're um, also adding training and coaching to that as well. That's that's brilliant. Sounds like a a, a fascinating plan. And if I did, I did a bit tiny bit of research as well, and I know I noticed one thing that you had like a is it a 50, 50, 20 zip plan? Yes. Or your thing. Do you just want to go into that bit? So just kind of get some context to it. Yeah, sure. So I, I mentioned it briefly, but I didn't finish on it. But um, so we said we we want to be fifty fifty on gender, so a male female split, and we've increased from thirty six to forty two percent. So we've seen a really positive move there. And um, we said we wanted to get to 20% on ethnic minorities. Um, I think so we were at 8% before, I think we're on 10 to 11% now. So we've seen a slower increase there, um, which is something which has kind of made us stop and think, what is it we need to do? Um, and, you know, I always say with diversity, your work's never done. You, you don't yeah. pick a box. You don't say, we're finished now, let's all go out and celebrate. Yeah. It's, it's constant. It is, yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, final question yeah. for yourself is, um, what does the future of diversity, equity, inclusion uh, and the future of work as well, what does it look like for the future of work and the future workplace as well? Yeah, I think, um, where, where to start with this really, but I think diversity um, gets to a place where it, within every company's strategy, um, and the same with sustainability as well. All of these things should be part of what every company does and that you know should be talked about in everyone's uh, performance review and everyone has a role to play in that. In terms of the elements of diversity, I think that's constantly changing. But until we get to a point where you know our workforces and our content truly represents the population of this country, there's still more work to do. And we're always learning as well. So, you know, if you think about transgender people, I think 20 years ago, most of us wouldn't have known much about that or known 
you know well it was non-existent experience. in terms of it was non-existent yeah. in terms of strategies and 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 as, as a culture culture mention of it, it was it was non-existent yeah and yet there were people going through those emotions and thinking yeah. that they didn't feel it didn't feel wrong um so you know we don't know what, what we'll be talking about in 20 years and i find that also really fascinating there's always so much more to learn no that's very fascinating Barney, thank you very much for your time really appreciate your uh, time and your uh, your thoughts and input into this conversation thank you Issa. i enjoyed talking to you